Uh, we want to start, of course, you like my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles since they're all named after famous Renaissance painters, by the way, if you did not know that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that makes sense. Donatello, yeah. yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. That makes a list. It does. Okay. So this is a quote by Marsilio Ficino. And we want to talk about what he has to say here. So, yeah, yeah. Right. so he was a Florentine philosopher, just to kind of tell you who this random person is that I'm quoting here. And he lived from 1433 to 1499. And this is just a few years before he died. Uh, he says this in 1492. And so he expresses, he's kind of one of the first people who like bring attention to the fact that, hey, things are different. He's not the only person that says it, but it's kind of, I guess it's the way he says it, kind of like if you if you took you as his bat, and that becomes the name of it. Um, you Different eras are defined by different people. And so this is what, Marsilio Ticinio has to say, our Plato in the Republic, Plato, like all those years ago, Plato, transferred the four ages of lead, iron, silver, and gold described by the poets long ago to types of men according to their intelligence. So if we are to call any age golden, it must certainly be our age, which has produced such a profusion of golden intellects. Evidence of this is provided by the inventions of this age. For this century, like a golden age, has restored to light the liberal arts that were almost extinct. Grammar, poetry, oratory, painting, sculpture, architecture, music, and the ancient singing of songs to the Orphic lyre, and all this in Florence. The two gifts venerated by the ancients, but almost totally forgotten, since have been reunited in our age. Wisdom with eloquence and prudence with the military art. The most striking example of this is Federico Duke of Urbino. And you too, my dear Paul, who seem to have perfected astronomy. And Florence, where the platonic teachings have been recalled from darkness into light. In Germany in our time have been invented the instruments for printing books, the Gutenberg printing press. And not to mention the Florentine machine, which shows the daily motions of the heavens, the telescope. Tables have been invented, which, so to speak, reveal the entire face of the sky for a whole century in one hour. And so he realizes that he is living in a time that he refers to as an intellectual revolution. And Marsilio, this philosopher and theologian, his, uh, the translations and commentary, on, he makes a very famous work that is about Plato. And Plato's contribution to the revival during the Renaissance. A little bit about Pacinio. He was born in a place, I love this, called Fig Lion. Big line. It was an area near Florence. He spent his life studying medicine and philosophy, but then he became very interested in the Greek people. And so he was encouraged by an Italian banker and statesman by the name of Cosimo. It's like Cosmo, but with an I thrown in there. Cosimo. De Medici. Medici is M-E-D-I-C-I. -I. And this is Marsilio here. He just doesn't look that cheery in this painting. Of course, I also like in a lot of these, like the use of color. It almost looks like a half a face. Can you repeat your job? Cosimo. All right, here's Cosimo. Yeah. Can you so Cosimo is going to basically be, uh, your text talks about it encouraging him. But really, Cosimo's kind of his um, financier, almost. He encourages him by supporting him financially in this expedition. So, Vicinio is going to set up an academy called the Platonic Academy. Platonic, based on whose name? Plato. And here, 
they are going to make the first complete translation of the works of Plato into Latin. Now let's see, the Gutenberg Press, I never remember the year it was particularly invented. I have 1066 in my head, but I, don't know. I think that's something else. What did they translate? They translated the works of Plato. All right, so he invented the press in 1440. He began experimenting and he perfected it in 1450. Okay, so by this point, the press is still relatively new, but still, this is a huge, huge accomplishment. So they managed to translate these works uh, of Plato. And they translate them into Latin, and then they can print them. They can print them, literally print them. He also later translated works by Roman philosophers. One of those was a guy named Plotinus, P-L-O-T-I-N-U-S. Plotinus was a was called a Neoplatonic. In other words, he was a follower of Plato. You know. He basically just made that he supported the beliefs of Plato. So Ficini, Ficini is ordained as a priest in 1473. And after being ordained as a priest, he became a canon in Florence. Now, do I have any good Catholics? What does it mean to become a canon? have any bad Catholics. All right, now if I remember correctly, I want to make sure I'm telling you correct on this. It basically means that he is over his own um, area. Okay, so a canon is a member of the chapter of priests headed by a dean, which is responsible for administering a cathedral are certain, certain other churches that are styled collegiate churches. So basically this means he is over a cathedral that has a um, an academic world there, which kind of fits with him. It kind of fits with him. Yeah, I didn't completely understand the difference between a canon and a bishop. So that makes sense. So they're over a cathedral with an educated component. All right, so speaking about Ficini and why it becomes so important, um, so a little bit about his works. So one of his most famous works is Theologica Platonica, which although these are Greek words or Latin words, you can kind of figure them out, can't you? Theologic, theology, what does that have to do with? God, yeah. Theos uh, is God, and so theology is the study of religion, so theologica, I am sure, is along those same lines. So what theologica platonica actually means, published in 1482, it literally is the study of, of the immorality of the soul. The study of how your soul is immortal. That means basically does not die. So when the body passes, the soul remains. Now, his work is based on his knowledge of another philosopher, which is St. Thomas. He also takes into account um, cosmology, not to be confused with cosmetology. What is the cosmos? The sky, the stars, right? So cosmology is the study of? Yes. So he takes into account cosmology and the influence of the stars upon human life. And it is interesting, we'll 
side note here with us talking about Platonica and all this kind of stuff. He writes a commentary on one of Plato's most famous works. The, the work is a work called Symposium. Symposium, S-Y-M-P-O-S-I-U-M. And in the work Symposium, he introduces the notion of a term that he refers to as platonic love. Now, what is platonic love? If your love for someone is platonic, do what? You only love them? I can't hear you. Is that it's intimate without sex. Well, platonic means yeah. Platonic means no no sexual intimacy. So, you know, I would assume that there's only platonic love in here. You know, platonic love, basically your friends, you're close with your friends, because a lot of the times when people use the term intimate, they're just using it romantically. Platonic is a, that would probably be a good term to explain. It's a non-romantic love. So platonic is a love where you are not interested in you are thinking of monogamy. I was trying to, I'm like, there's a word she's thinking of here, and I was trying to, I was like, exclusive? No, but monogamy would be, yeah. Yeah. But platonic, if you have platonic love for somebody, uh, I think the first time I remember hearing the word platonic, I was watching like a movie in the 80s or early 90s. I was much younger, obviously. And or they said something about our relationship was platonic. And I'm like, oh, what's that mean? <laughs> so yeah, it was a little disappointing to me. But anyway. So platonic love is basically where it is, it is an innocent kind of love where there is no romantic inclination. It is intimate and personal, um, brotherly love, so to speak, but that comes from um, Plato's Symposium. So, yeah. The concept of a special friendship was based on the love of God in this literature of the late Renaissance era. So, you know, you... Hopefully you have people in your life that you love for not just romantic reasons. And that's a, that's a good thing to have. So let's talk about Cosimo. Cosimo. A little bit about him, this Italian banker and statesman. Um, one of his titles is Cosimo the Elder, which makes me think there must have been like a Cosimo, bless you. There must have been like a Cosimo the Younger somewhere, but he was not that guy. He was the elder. He is succeeded by, um, he, excuse me, he succeeded his father. Now, his father is a very important man in Italy, and his name is Giovanni, which is a great Italian name. Uh, my first cousin married an uh, Italian guy. They live in California. She has a son named Giovanni and Cristiano, and then she has a little girl named Giovanna. And so very deep Italian roots connected to that name. So Giovanna, Giovanni had been um, the father here, and he was an extremely successful banker. Daddy, Daddy Warbucks here. Daddy was worth a lot of money. And so Cosimo kind of comes in to money here. Because his family had all of this money. They made their money through commercial and banking interest. Now, what does commercial mean? We've talked about this a couple of times. Anytime we refer to commercial, we're referring to business. And so they make their money through good business and through good banking techniques. Can't go wrong with those. He also, daddy, was a leader of a popular faction in Florentine politics. So kind of like today how we have different parties, except they had more than just two. Mm -hmm. But one of the popular factions, faction means like a group, right? In their political system, Giovanni was the leader of that group. But what's interesting about him is he had some problems because of that. Politics can mess you up, if you did not know that. Uh, I, if, if you ever go through working with a campaign or if you ever have a family member go to run for office, 
you understand how absolutely nasty people can be because when people run for office, like we kind of assassinate their character, don't we? And I'm not talking about, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah, but they deserve it. But I, I mean, even like people who don't deserve it, you know, everything you do gets picked apart in politics. And that is a hard position to be in when it's somebody you know. And you know, I, I think a lot of times, like when we talk about these political figures sometimes, and even their families become targets, don't they? You know, um, and this is something to realize. But anyway, so he was exiled. Giovanni was exiled by the ruling aristocratic party in 1433. However, he wasn't done. I like him. He was recalled the following year. So they kicked him out in the following year. They're like, hey, Giovanni, come on back. And he does. He was kicked out in 1433. He was back in 1434. And when he does, he assumes control, virtual control of the government. So he takes over. Now, he secured his position with the government by banishing some of his enemies. I mean, that's a pretty good way to keep your position, right? You kick the other guys out. And the ones he didn't banish, he had something for them too. He ruined them by excessive taxes. So you either got kicked out are he excessively taxed you? I really don't know which is worse. So the son here, Cos Cosimo, was a shrewd politician. And he had some different sentiments than his dad. He did not want to hold public office. Oftentimes, children of politicians have no desire to be politicians themselves because they see how ugly the system can be. Instead, he does govern his supporters and dependents, but that's about it. The money he does manage to acquire financially benefits both Florence and his family. And so what's interestingly enough is although Cosimo has no desire to be involved in politics, he is probably the wealthiest man in Italy at this time or in this era. So some things that he encouraged. Because basically my philosophy is when you see somebody does something better than you, the smart thing to do is to figure out how they do it, right? And so they kind of look at him and they're like, how are you making your money? And he tells them what to do. So he encourages to expand agriculture. He encourages the silk industry. Because remember, they kind of discovered silk with the Crusades. And they're like, oh, it's so pretty. And he encourages commerce. Now we know commerce is business and trade. What was your first thing? Agriculture. Commerce and silk. So some things that he tries to do to protect these industries. He tries his best to remain to maintain peace and balance. A balanced economy, if your economy is not balanced, it will eventually be unsuccessful no matter what. Uh, if you took my A push class, we talked about that with the South. How the South had this huge economy. Uh, pre-Civil War and it looked like it was booming, but it was eventually, even if they had not have fallen in the way they did, economically they were headed for a fall one way or another because that one crop economy is just not smart. That's why he promotes balance. He also wanted to prevent foreign interference because when other nations, when other people start sticking their hands in the Kool-Aid, it can cause problems, Right. And so he doesn't want other nations to interfere. That's a big thing for him. Now, we're talking about this very rich Italian man. And this is supposed to be a lecture on the artist of the Italian Renaissance. How does this 
play it. Well, here's how. He actively spent money to patronize artists, architects, and scholars. He also amassed, great word there, a huge library. Now, the truth is today, if you know where to shop, you can, you can have a lot of books and not be a wealthy person. But back then, books were expensive. You say he patronized artists, architects, scholars, and and he amassed a massive library. He also establishes a public building program that is so impressive that other members of his family that follow him and also other rulers are going to follow in his footsteps. So this is why he ties in to the Renaissance. So what is the Renaissance. Well, re means again, pretty much. <clears throat> Rebirth. Refuel. You know, anytime you use that, it means do it again. So Renaissance is this idea of a reawakening interest, particularly in values and culture. One of the things I, I really have grown to like about Western Civ, because as all of you are aware, and I'm sure it's very obvious, that it is outside of my comfort zone in a lot of ways because I am an American historian. That is, my, that is where I've spent my majority of my time studying. And so it causes me to have to study and like and read into this stuff and learn more about it. And I like that. I like to learn. But one of the themes that I've found that's kind of interesting in our studies over the years, and hopefully you've seen this as well, is this constant like love for all things Greek and all things Roman seem to always resurface. Even like when we think about our systems in the United States all of these years later, you know, so many of our buildings that are like our government buildings have this Greek and Romanesque approach to it. You know, we're a democratic republic. Those were the governments of Greece and Rome. And so we see all of these remnants of these societies. And so the culture and the value that they placed in the Renaissance were a rebirth of the cultures of Greece and Rome. Big surprise there, right? So I just I like to I like how that makes that kind of rebirth. All right. So let's talk about Bithynia. Bithynia. What's interesting about Ficinio, and I don't think I have him. Yeah, I don't. All right. Yeah, I didn't do one. Okay. What's interesting, coming back to, there he is, Ficinio. Uh, he was scorned. He scorned at first as the ignorance of the barbarism of the dark ages, like all of this idea of people like gathering together to go kill all these other people. Like when we talked about the first crusade, making it to Jerusalem, they killed everybody. That's pretty savage. You know, that's like a generation gone by. Like, you know, that's general Custer or not Custer, but that is like, for those of you that study the St. Creek massacre, where he's like kill and scalp all big and little. I mean, this is savage. And so Ficinio is going to scorn this, this barbarism and this ignorance of the Dark Ages. And many of the people of Florence thought the same. They basically saw that there was a thousand-year drought after the fall of Western Rome. That for a thousand years, culture had just been kind of like, I think about it like leftovers. 
you pretty much keep repeating. What probably becomes really common, and it becomes common in all of our houses, is we cook the same thing over and over, right? And we're like, oh, these are the five dishes we make, and that's what we make. And so this is kind of where the art has become. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. I love finding an artist that I, I'm not going to say I'm not a fan of art because that's not true, but I don't really look for a lot of art, if that makes sense. But I love when I find an artist that's new to me that has just a great style that doesn't really look like everybody else's and it's kind of got a unique perspective and it's not like a few like dots on the wall. You know, I love something that just has a different look to it and it totally is theirs. Uh, I even love with student art sometimes when you can look at that art and be like, I know who drew that, you know, because you see their flair. It's the David Warhol kind of effect. Uh, so anyway. Uh, so this has been a thousand years with nothing. And so the Renaissance are, which literally translates in French to rebirth, is what he saw that he and other Florins were in. He believed they were living in this golden age of culture, of times. And so he and other, others believed, though, that they failed to understand the gap between their period and the Middle Evil period. You know, there are some points in history when you wonder if the people walking through those days of history realized the point they were living in was significant. And he says that a lot of the people in his time period don't know that they're even having this transition in art. And I think kind of even living in this time period where there is so much strife I think it will be interesting to look back 20 years later, or 30 years later, or even 50 years later, because I'm not planning on dying any country, and see how all of this kind of shook out. Because as we look through so many time periods in history, eventually everything shakes out in the wash. Sometimes not the way we want it to, right? Sometimes it shakes out pretty rough. But to see how all of the things that are going on in our world right now shake out. And I think that's where he is. He's like, y'all don't even realize that this is an important time. And sometimes people don't. And that's okay, too. Sometimes people go through their daily lives and they make no nuisance of themselves. And they live and they die and that's it. But he knows that this is something special and it makes him furious. So to speak, that the rest of people don't get that, you know? And I don't know, perhaps maybe some of you have had some of those sentiments, especially over the past year. And, you know, when we look back at this past year, it has been a wild year. In some ways, it's been a, a very long, well, it has been a very long year. But, you know, something I, I've thought a lot about is sometimes we classify things as bad because they're inconvenient. But inconvenient isn't always bad. And so he realizes they're in a time of change and is not completely sure how it's all going to shake out. But I do feel like we're in kind of that same sort of period of change. Except we're not creating really cool art, though. That would be nice. However, back to the Renaissance. He knows that they really don't completely get this. Even if they do know that there's a change, they don't completely understand what the change is. Why is that? Well, I have a theory with that. For one thing, today it's hard to see the big picture in society, but I think we have access to so much that we see so much of the picture, we don't know what to make of it. But back then, they didn't have the access to things that we did, right? I mean, like, it isn't like if you've heard of this new artist, you could go and look him up on your smartphone. Where today we have such instant access that we have access to so much that it is overwhelming almost. And it becomes, we're over inundated with all of it. But anyway. So some of the differences that he likes. The first, let's talk about Romanesque art and architecture. We're just talking about him, right? I'm sorry? We're just talking about him? Yes. Okay. And just kind of, yeah. We're not going to stand him for long. But he is kind of this person who we credit with saying, hey, this is an important period. And, you know, it's funny that when you look at this, that you get this attention 
for being the guy who's like, hey, this time period matters. But realistically, somebody almost has to bring our attention to those things, don't they? They have to be like, hey, did you guys notice this is going on? And that's what he really does. And I don't know, it is kind of funny how his name is in this, even though he himself was not a creator. You know, but he's kind of like the guy who figured it out. He broke the puzzle. So let's talk about some of the arts. Romanesque art and architecture. Arts and architecture of Western Europe from around 1000 to the rise of the Gothic style. In most regions by the later half of the 12th century, in certain regions, somewhat later. And I showed you a lot of the Gothic churches, you know, very severe lines, right? They were less round and more like angular. They had those flying buttresses, such a great word. And so they had all of that kind of architecture by this later half of this 12th century. And so these outstanding achievements of this Romanesque architecture were the development of using a couple of new things, and that was stone and vaulted buildings. Stone and vaulted buildings buildings. Now let's talk about what an arch and a vault is because I'm very visual as most of you are very aware. All right so let's check this out together. Well that's what I meant. All right, so these, these are vaulted ceilings. You see how it's like kind of like this weird like multi-faceted. Now, I showed you the picture of the National Cathedral. The ceilings in there are like that. They're vaulted. They have that weird like connection there. Not to be confused with, that's the vault. So let's look at the arch. So the arch, see how the vault was more complex, but the arch is more singular? They're the same concept, right? And so you see arches that are used to hold things up, where with vaults, you see it's like a cross configuration here. And so they use these vaulted ceilings. They are absolutely stunning, too. Uh, that's from the Saint Sovereign Church in Paris. Wasn't there a building called Jesus? Yeah, the National Cathedral. That's Did we go? I don't remember seeing one. I have a picture of Let's see. You went on the last trip we did. Mm -hmm. We didn't do the cathedral, but I'm trying to think where we would have gone. Probably. I can picture it, but I don't remember. Do you remember anything we did there? Or? We just went, like, our, we were on our own. So it's probably one of the Smithsonian's. Yeah. So this is a different type of vaulted. It's a rounded vault, which is odd, but it's supported by the arches then as well. It's very pretty. It looks um, St. Paul's Cathedral Choir in London. Beautiful. Anyway, I love cathedrals. I I find them very interesting. And so this new type of architecture uh, was a fundamental construction system that was used to span spaces. And with this, they could create more sturdy walls, piers, roofs, ceilings, you know, all of this stuff is going to be more sturdy. Until the, eight, the 19th century, which would be the 1800s, the arch and vault... <laughs> were the only alternative to the more simpler and limited houses. So if you wanted big, tall ceilings, are you know where you might be thinking of the Library of Congress? Yeah, because yes. I remember the, the big books. Uh, the Library of Congress is just absolutely, to me, that's one of the prettiest buildings inside. On the outside, it's like, okay, but let's see, when you get inside, yeah, that's it. So on the outside, it's nothing fa fabulous, but these are these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I love that. 
But yeah, and it has all these different authors' names. Yes, it is. And, and it also has like little, it's a mosaic, mm -hmm. the little rocks and yeah, so pretty. Um, first time I actually ended up in there was, I really had no idea it was as pretty as it was. It's getting Holocaust tickets and the Holocaust Museum isn't far down. And the rest of the students were at the Spy Museum, which we really don't do because it's one of the more expensive museums in D.C., and we found that the students had the least interest in it. So I'm like, why are we paying so much money for something they're not liking? And so we kind of, we cut it unless it's just a year we have a ton of time. And um, like I said, it's, it's the most expensive one. And most everybody was out in 45 minutes. So you're like, that was a really expensive hour of our life. <laughs> and so anyway, but we would do that. And that day that we did that was usually the day I would go and get tickets because, to be quite frank, I didn't like going to it anyway. So I would let them like, yeah, okay. So we switched that all around a little bit. But anyway, while I was down getting uh, tickets that year, I looked at my watch and they hadn't even got in yet. So they had about another hour. And the two people that were there with me said that we could get enough tickets for the Holocaust. We said, well, we've got an hour before they're going to come and pick us up. What can we do? And so I looked at what's close to see to hear him. One was the Library of Congress. And so we took about a probably point a quarter and a half mile walk. And the outside is just, you know, okay. You think, okay, it's a big library. But when we walked inside and we looked up and we saw those just gorgeous ceilings. Um, it just, it's phenomenal. So anyway. So there's a major practical reason for the development of the masonry or building of this kind of vaulting. Pretty much, what were the roofs made of before? What did they make the roofs from before? What do you think? Just don't make this hard. What do you think these peasantry people? Yeah, wood and straw. Yeah, and what happens if that catches fire? In fact, that is why Great Fire of London, it just like burned the whole town down because most of their buildings had straw on the roof and nothing burns like straw. Like when straw catches fire, those thatched roofs, they, they go up. Dry. Yeah, it's dry. And it's, it's basically the stuff you put on a fire to keep it going. You know, if you really want a, a fire to go well, that's why oftentimes like when you hear about people that have, um, of course, growing up around horses, uh, barn fires are always bad because if you have hay in them, it's just, it's going to catch and spread very quickly. Um, and yeah. So. My, um, my mom and dad raised horses, and fortunately, we never had anything like that at our farm. However, um, two different families connected to us did. And one, um, they, my parents are this little girl's godparents. And so they're, um, they neither, anyway, they, Shelby was their god, or is their goddaughter. And they had a hard time finding her a pony. And so my mom, like, really is good at it. She's really good at what she does. And so she found this little pony for Shelby. And uh, they, Kept it and won. It, he was a two or three time state champion, and their barn caught fire and he died. And all their animals and they died. And it was just not only the trauma of you know losing something as a pet, but in such a brutal way. Mm -hmm. And we also had some other friends that um, we showed horses with for years. That not long after I moved down here, the the barn that they had their animals in kind of caught fire. And uh, they think maybe a cigarette or something, and, and they all die. So, anyway. But we digress. So let's talk a little bit about Gothic, Gothic art. Gothic art, architecture, and religious and secular buildings. They're full of sculptures, stained glass. Sometimes they'll have illuminated manuscripts. Like you may come up and there's like this open Bible. Or this open holy book that has like a piece with like a lighting part on it to kind of bring emphasis to it. Uh, these are all part of the arts of this time. They're all part of decorative arts that start around 1140 and are going to last until around the 16th century. Now, 
it's interesting when you use the term gothic, like, um, of course, gothic today has come to represent a whole other thing. But when we think about these old gothic churches uh, and we talk about them in that way, it's funny because it happened before the Italian Renaissance. And the Italian Renaissance people actually used the word gothic as like insulting. But now we call those churches that saying they're beautiful gothic churches. And it was used as like an insulting term. Basically, they were talking about it as being dated. Gothic means from of, of an age gone by. They basically compared these works in these churches from this Gothic time to the works of the barbarians who were called the Goths. And so they're basically like, that's that old nasty people work. And of course, now we use that as like an endearing term towards those churches. So it's funny how vocabulary develops over time. So, of course, since then, the Gothics has been restricted to the last major medieval period following the Romanesque, and it's considered to be the most outstanding artistic era, especially of architecture. So some distinguishing characteristics. What makes it different is that vault. That vault, those thin intersecting arches. The ribs that with their points that connect brings them a lot of strength, and they can support the masonry that are, is put upon them. So after this Romanesque precedent, a multitude of carved figures proclaiming the dogmas and beliefs of the churches are going to fill these cathedrals. Gothic sculptures became very popular in the 12th and 13th century and was basically their predominant architecture. The largest and most important of these figures are those oversized statues that often embraced on either side of the doorways. Now, eventually, at first those statuesque columns were used to support the loads of the building, but of course now mostly they are just for, um, for show, for look, whatever. I think about if you walk outside of our campus on either the Tucker Street entrance or the uh, Market Street entrance there, you find the big columns, right? And although I'm sure they do help kind of support the weight of that porch, the whole building is not reliant upon those columns for survival as it once would have been. So uh, the Florentines believed that this revival of culture of antiquity was part of the outstanding character of the era. This whole revival, this whole artistic creativity, really, though, is only one aspect of the Renaissance. Now, when we think about the Renaissance, we think about particular people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and his work, The Mona Lisa. But it's, it's a lot more than just that. You see, as we said, it changes every aspect of society going from the political. It changes how the government's going to be ran. It changes the social, the religious, and the cultural. It is a change from the previous era, but it is inspired by that classical eras of the past. And so, how is it different? Well, the medieval culture centered on God's will. God's will. They believed, and we've talked about a good bit of this, that humans were sinful. That heavenly existence after earthly life was a real thing. And um, they also had these really ridiculously specific arguments about theology. Now, I'm not talking about the ones that are arguing over the Trinity and things like that that I would consider actually concrete arguments. One of the more famous arguments that almost erupted in a, basically a massacre, was how many angels can dance on the head of one hen. You know, the important stuff. So religion firmly rejected life in this world. The religion of the medieval period believed that what is going on today, life today, life as we know it, human life, is 
quite frankly, evil and useless. Life today is evil and useless. And it is also perilous to our soul. In other words, it is destructive to us. And so, many of these people in that era believed that it was their responsibility, therefore, to abandon the secular culture of their day and to favor the life of a monk, or a person who only featured, studied on religious teaching. So a little bit about the Renaissance culture, the thinkers, the writers, and the artists. The Renaissance culture made man, not God, the center. They glorified the human body as beautiful. They saw human intellect as capable of unlocking the deepest mysteries of nature through rational process. Now, any of you that remember studying transcendentalism with me, it kind of, I see remnants of transcendentalism in this movement. They saw humanist is what they are called, and they argued that God, in fact, wanted men to engage in political and civic life. He wants you to discover and to create. He wants you to marry and to have families. That goes against that monastic life, right? Because of the monastic life, you would be celibate. And so they're like, no, that isn't what God wants. He wants you to create and discover and marry and have families and do all these things. And so they begin to see the secular sphere. What happens outside of the church in accordance with the will of God? So let's talk about a couple of key figures here. All right. The first one is Vitruvius. V I T R U V I O U S. Vitruvius, if you want to know his full name, it's Vitruvius Polio, which is just kind of depressing a little bit. Um, he was alive from 70 to 25 BC. Now, this may seem like we are majorly going back, but there's a purpose for this. He is going to be a huge inspiration, 70 to 25 BC. He is really considered to be one of the strongest um, inspirations for Leonardo da Vinci. All right, so Vitruvius Polio was a Roman architect and engineer from Italy. And he was under the service of Augustus, you know, like Augustus Caesar, Julius's nephew. Same one. He wrote 10 books on architecture. And if you want to know what they were actually called, it was De Architectura. Ten books on architecture. These are the oldest surviving works on the subject of architecture. Obviously, he was kind of obsessed with it. A lot of his ideas, why they are important to the Renaissance, is guess who he takes them from? Who are the two groups? From Greece and Rome. Very good. And so he seems to have been assessed, especially with Greek, but also there is a lot of classical Roman architecture. And so his works resurface as being significant during this time because of his writings on Greek and Roman architecture. So moving into the Italian Renaissance, the actual time period it took place is kind of dated between the 14th and 16th century. So that would be the 13 through 1500s. It's hard to say exactly when it ends because, you know, it, it isn't like there is a specific event. One thing that's nice about history is sometimes you can mark off history in time periods that are very obvious. You know, this war starts on this day or, you know, we always consider the Great Depression starts on 29 because of that stock market crash. There are specific events. But with this, it just kind of fades. So why does it start in Italy? Well, for one thing, the survival of Roman arch uh, artistic and architectural heritage. 
because that is what they, they knew. They also still spoke Latin. Italy profited from both Islamic and Byzantine cultural influences, and trade remained important in Italy. And so because they're open to all of this, they're also open to capitalism. They're seeing things that come from other countries. And one of the things about creativity is the more different things you see help to spark creativity, right? The more things you're exposed to. Uh, if you like to write music or something like that, the more different types of music you hear, you get ideas. You know, and that's that's how this works. It harnessed the resources for this development. Italy is also less feudal. Remember the feudal system? The lords and such. It is also less feudal. And pretty much as with all of these people coming their direction for the Crusades, they're going to be exposed to a lot of outside ideas as well. So what are the most prominent commercial centers? The first one is Genoa, G-E-N-O-A. The second is Venice. And in fact, Genoa is uh, part of Romeo and Juliet is set there. The second is Venice. And the last is Milan, which Milan is still a fra uh, fashion center as well. These three cities competed with each other to see who basically could be the top city. Genoa, G-E-N-O-A, Venice, and lastly, Milan. Writers also are going to stimulate the Renaissance in Italy. They pushed for works about the delight on the physical world. One of the most famous to do this is Francisco Petro. I thought I had. No, I guess not. All right. You see the different statues. I thought I did, but I guess I don't. There's humanism. All right. Well, anyway. So Petrarch is spelled P-E-T-R-A-C-H. So Petrarch was considered the father of humanism. He is going to idolize Roman authors. He also emulated literary compositions, and he's famous for his poetry. Petrarch is a famous poet. He writes a lot about nature, and he also writes tender love sonnets. All of his sonnets are about his burning love for a woman named Laura. Now, some interesting little points about Laura. First of all, she was married, but not to him. And so he adores her at a distance. Second, from the poems, we are led to believe that he actually never meets her. So he's kind of stalking Laura. He struggled against the medieval notion that God wished man to renounce material things. Another famous Italian author that he is going to follow up is Giovanni Boccaccio. Lots of C's. Giovanni Boccaccio. He was an Italian writer and humanist and one of the greatest authors of all time. Not to overplay his role here. It's believed that he was, his life is kind of weird. So it's believed he was born in Paris. And he was the illegitimate son of a merchant from Florence and a French noblewoman. And so he gets sent to live in Florence um, in 1323 and study accounting. Now, at this time that he is studying accounting, he is the ripe old age of 10. So at 10, he goes to live with Pops to become an accountant. And 
the accounting he's actually studying would be doing work for the church. And quite frankly, that did not interest this 10-year-old boy. And so he gives up that philosophy to do classical and scientific studies. And he returns to Florence himself in about 1340. But in 1350, he met Petrarch. He remained a close friend of Petrarch until his death in 1374. But that this chance meeting definitely changed both of their lives. His most important work is called, I'll give you just the English translation, it's called Ten Days Work. Interestingly enough, although it was called Ten Days Work, it took him five years to write it. He started it in 1348 and completed it in 1353. It's a collection, kind of reminds me of the Canterbury Tales. It's a collection of 10 witty, high-spirited stories. And it's set within a framework. Again, it's going to be a lot like the Canterbury Tales. It's a group of friends. Seven women and three men. These friends are all well-bred. They're worth, they're of discretion, they're highly thought of, and they decide that they need to escape an outbreak of the plague. I kind of get that. The plague is not something I want to be around. And so they take refuge outside of Florence. And over that time period, for 10 days, hence the title, they decide to each take turns telling a story. Like I said, a lot like the Canterbury Tales. So one story each day. Each storytelling ends with a canzone. Now I know you have probably never heard the term canzone, but I'm going to help you out. So what is a canzone? A canzone is a short lyrical poem. And the purpose of the canzone um, is basically it's usually to portray the story of love. So he ends with this canzone, this love poem of each of these stories. And so not only is he putting ideas out there about basically these entertainment stories, but also he puts his poetry out there as well. So at the conclusion of the 100th tale, the friends return to their home in the city. Um, and this 10 days work that he wrote truly becomes considered to be a masterpiece. It is considered a masterpiece. All right. Sorry, I got to do this. Okay. So, where did these writers go? Well, the Renaissance writers usually. Um, still were successful when the Byzantines came in. Many of the scholars are going to flee to Constantinople before it fell in 1453. And many of their works are going to be translated into other countries, but mostly we are going to see them transcribed and proliferated. Some other things that come out with their works, they start to produce a study of language and literature in things like dictionaries. Before this time, a dictionary wasn't something that existed. Now, the most important work, though, that we have to discuss is Machiavelli's The Prince. Can I find The Prince? Yes. The Prince. The Prince is considered the ultimate work of the Renaissance. This was written by Niccolo Machiavelli. The Principatus, Princip, Princat, of us, uh, or of Principalities, the Prince. Now, this work is very significant. The Prince uh, basically is how Machiavelli pretty much explains how political life is ran. His writings are concerned with the principles on which a state is founded. And in 1532, 
He writes the prints. He describes the method by which a prince or ruler can obtain power and maintain political power. So it's one thing to get power, but how do you maintain it? Now, this particular study has often been concluded to be a handbook for despotism. What's another word for a despot? Anybody remember hearing the word despot or despotism? Tyrant. So this handbook for despotism or tyranny is based on Machia Machiavelli's belief that a ruler is not bound by ethics or norms. So pretty much when you are trying to be in control, you don't have to worry about having good ethics or morals. You can do what you need to, to essentially gain that position. In his view, Machiavelli's view, a prince should only be concerned with power. And therefore, the rules that would normally bound us as people and in society, he should not worry about. Because if he does worry about those rules, he will not be successful in politics. Very cutthroat, isn't it? So what this is basically saying is that pretty much these people in the earlier political days that were successful, they did so by not worrying about people. It was kind of an any means necessary. And that is his argument of how one takes power. Machiavelli's The Prince is one of the most famous works. Outside of Italy, another famous um, Englishman is going to be a guy named Thomas More. Sir Thomas More. When I see More talked about, usually they misspell his last name and put the two O's in there. So More was an English statesman and writer, and he is known for taking a religious stance against Henry VIII, the guy who had all the wives. That religious stance cost him his life. But what he is actually known for with the Renaissance is his work. Utopia. Utopia. Utopia by Moore is published in 1516. It is a satirical account of life on a fictitious island. On the island, the interests of the individuals are subject to society at large. So it's almost like a form of socialism, if you will. All people must do some work. They offer universal education and religious tolerations are practiced. And all land is common owned. Again, very this in a socialism. These conditions are contrasted with those of the English society at that time because of the disadvantage of the poor. So Moore's work, Utopia, is a very famous work. And in the 1800s in the U.S., we have people that try to form utopian societies. Have you heard that expression before? And so this is where that idea of utopian societies come from, this idea of community owning. So there you go. The next scholar that we want to mention is Erasmus, which I think is kind of a great name too, Erasmus. He's another humanist and scholar, and he is the chief interpreter to Northern Europe of the intellectual currents of the Renaissance. He held that Latin and Christianity should be taught in the home before uh, formal schooling at the age of seven. So basically, he argues that it's the job of the family to teach their children how to speak Latin, write Latin, and how to be Christian. And then at seven, they start their formal education. Most of his early work attacked the corrupt practices of the church and the things that are being done by church men. His most famous work is The Praise of Folly. The Praise of Folly, and folly is spelled not how actual folly is spelled in English. 
He dedicates his work to more, and he believes in the idea of, a, um, he advocates a return to a simple Christian ethics, going back to the simplistic Christian ways. He also translates the New Testament into Greek. And so we see the New Testament is translated by him as well. It is argued that the Greek was more accurate than the Latin Vulgate that had existed before. And so because of these works, influential religious reformers call Erasmus the father of the Reformation. Now, we are not to the Reformation we will actually cover the Reformation. That will be one of the first things we cover in Western Civ 2. But this is showing how the Renaissance and all of that writing and all of that art is going to lead into the writing of the Reformation. So his translation of the New Testament helps, helps to do that. Some people often consider him like a precursor of this. Uh, his works, though, interestingly enough, we're in the index of forbidden books by the Council of Trent. And so it's kind of funny that where he really does a lot to bring on the Reformation, that they actually start to <laughs> block him. He was not a religious reformer, like people like Martin Luther and John Calvin are going to be. Instead, though, he, he didn't even like to participate in theological discussions or arguments. And so I guess that's where he differs. He was purely a man who liked to write and a humanist, and he was basically um, on the prefaces of this new age of reform. And that is where we will stop. So when you think about the Renaissance, yes, the art is a huge part of it, but the change it's going to bring in culture and in philosophy and these things is going to be just as impactful in its own way. All right, so you will have a Renaissance assignment that will be up, uh, I believe, for this week. Let's see, we, yeah, we don't, we meet back on Thursday. Uh, you also have an assignment that is up based on the Crusades. I know you guys covered the Crusades last week, but your assignment for it is this week because I try to keep it on the same page with the two classes. So that will be up soon.
Thank <laughs> you. 